Chapter 11 of Petticoat Government, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leader. Chapter 11 of Petticoat Government, Volume 2 by Francis Milton Trollope. It was very punctually at midday that Mr. Dorking was ushered into Mrs. Chilbert's drawing room. There was nothing in the least degree approaching embarrassment on the part of a lady, and very little on that of a gentleman. Her mother wit had enabled her to predict with a confidence which pretty nearly amounted to certainty that Judith was to be the subject of their tete-a-tete, -tete, and his estimate of Mrs. Chilbert's sagacity was sufficiently just to make him feel equally sure that she so interpreted his note. The friendly smile with which she held out her hand as he approached her rendered all that was to follow perfectly easy on both sides. Her indignation at learning the undue exercise of authority displayed by her utter aversion, Miss Barbara, was everything he could wish it to be, while the delicately hinted encouragement which, under the circumstances she thought herself justified in giving, was precisely sufficient to sustain his hope that the affront he had received had in no way originated with his lady love, but was entirely and altogether the result of her detestable maiden aunt's wish to prevent her marrying. But why should she wish to prevent it? demanded the young man. His color modestly heightened by the consciousness that the proposal he had made was not such a one as maiden aunts in general would be likely to disapprove and thereupon Mrs. Chilbert, with her usual tact and delicacy, took occasion to mention the particulars of Judith's fortune and position, taking the liberty of hinting that, in her opinion, the conduct of Miss Barbara Jenkins could only be explained by supposing that she wished to retain the guardianship of a niece, for whose accommodation a very liberal stipend would doubtless be allowed by the court of chancery. "'Infamous!' exclaimed Mr. Dorking, with very natural indignation. It is indeed infamous, replied Mrs. Chilbert, so much so indeed, that I should scruple, greatly as I dislike the individual, to attribute such exceeding r vileness to her had I not some reason for doing so. But I happen to know that she has uttered a most preposterous untruth in stating Miss Maitland's age. She told Dr. Rothley that she was very little more than fourteen, whereas I happen to know from Judith herself that she was sixteen her last birthday. That she has an interested motive for all this is certain. Infamous! again exclaimed Mr. Dorking. I do not wonder at your feeling very indignant at such a statement, returned Mrs. Chilbert, smiling, and the more so, perhaps, because it is not quite impossible that other persons, your own family, for instance, may still think my dear little Judith somewhat too young to marry although two years older than her precious aunt states her to be. I own I thought from her form and stature that she must at least be seventeen, said the young man anxiously, and looking as if he hoped that his kind friend had blundered a little in her statement. No, she replied, shaking her head, Judith is little more than sixteen, I assure you, and though I see no reason why she should not be made acquainted with your flattering attachment, I confess that I think you must wait a little before you marry. I think she ought to be in her eighteenth year first. Frederick Dorking breathed the very lover-like sigh as he listened to these words. Nevertheless, he answered with a degree of candor which did him honor, that he thought she was right. As I have your sanction for doing so, he continued, I shall declare my hopes to her before I leave the neighborhood, and if I am favorably listened to, I think I shall have the courage to leave everything else in your hands. You do me honor, replied Mrs. Chilbert, smiling, and then added, more seriously, and I flatter myself that you do me justice, too, for sure I am that if Judith Maitland were my own daughter, I could not feel more anxious than I now do to lead her aright. I do indeed believe it, my dear Mrs. Chilbert, he replied, and do me the equal justice of believing that looking forward, as I dare venture to do, to making your lovely friend my wife, I feel the very deepest gratitude to fate and fortune for having placed her at this important period of her existence within reach of your influence. Poor little angel, I know not what would become of her just now without you. What would be her fate had she only her Aunt Barbara?' 
I certainly do flatter myself that I have been some comfort, ay, and of some use to her also, since she has come among us. And if, when your own higher claims are established, you will still permit it, I think my usefulness may continue for some time longer yet, replied Mrs. Chilbert. Mr. Dorking probably thought that the future usefulness to which she alluded was to be displayed in assisting at the selection of the wedding garments, for his answer was the happiest of all possible smiles. But this was not Mrs. Chilbert's meaning. I need not ask you, she resumed, what your opinion is of our sweet Judith's musical ability, for I have watched you when she has been singing, and assuredly no fanatico ever appeared more completely spellbound by sweet words. But as you've assured us that you practice not the art you seem so well to love, I think it's very likely that you may already consider Judith's singing as near perfection as it is possible for any performance of a mortal to be. Indeed I do, Mrs. Chilbert, he very energetically replied. Now then, she said, laughing, now I shall put your good temper to a most tremendous trial, for truth obliges me to declare that in this belief you are completely mistaken. The young man colored, but he smiled too, and therefore he probably was not very angry, but he was conscious of being most profoundly ignorant, and not choosing to confess that it was not without difficulty he could distinguish God save the Queen from Saira. He replied very adroitly that just at present it would be very difficult for him to persuade himself that anything done by Judith Maitland could be otherwise than well done. Perfectly natural, and therefore perfectly as it ought to be, replied Mrs. Chilbert, and for that very reason, you know, it becomes my duty and my character of mentor to take care that my dear disciple be not left too implicitly to your guidance. Judith must positively have a few singing lessons, Mr. Dorking, before she is promoted to the honors of matrimony. Fear not that I should oppose it, even were I already happy enough to have all power over her. But how is this to be managed? Or rather, to speak more honestly, how is her removal from the power of the she-dragon to be effected? How can I expect to be received by her on such a footing as I dare to hope for, as long as she remains under the protection of the lady who, without deigning to reply to my letter herself, has sent back that which was enclosed in it for her niece unopened. Yes, there are difficulties before us, Mr. Dorking, replied the dean's lady, rather gravely. I cannot deny it. However, honorable, flattering, and advantageous your proposal may be, it will not do to make the deanery the place of rendezvous between a young lady and a lover who has been treated by her appointed guardian as you have been. You can easily understand this, I am sure. Too easily, much too easily, dearest Mrs. Chilbert, he replied, and do not for a moment suppose that I would ever wish it. It would be equally objectionable for us all. The only favor which at this moment I will venture to ask of you, he continued, after the interval of a moment given to meditation, is that you would permit me to meet Miss Maitland here for half an hour in your presence before I leave this neighborhood. And that one favor I readily grant, replied Mrs. Chilbert, for I think the granting it much preferable to the alternative upon which my refusal would throw you, namely that of attempting a clandestine correspondence with my young friend by letter. Assuredly, such would be my only alternative, he replied, and I shall ever feel grateful to you for saving me from it. In your presence, then, I will renew the proposal I've already made, and my dearest hope must stand or fall according to the manner in which it shall be received. If this tremendous ordeal be passed favorably, I shall immediately state to my father and mother what has taken place, and we must flatter ourselves that by their intervention this awful Aunt Barbara may be induced to treat me somewhat more graciously. I must sincerely hope that we shall so manage matters as to find ourselves perfectly independent of Miss Barbara and her graciousness, which, trust me, would never be of a quality and flavor that we should any of us greatly relish, said Mrs. Chilbert. Perhaps you are not yet aware, she continued, that my dear Judith has another aunt residing in London, and though she also is of the old maid species and a little quizzical too in her way, is a very much less disagreeable specimen than our Miss Barbara. 
It rests with Judith, I believe, to decide with which of her two aunts she will reside. And after what has happened here, I, I should imagine that any aunt in the world would be deemed preferable to our Miss Barbara. Heaven only knows what I shall do without my sweet Judith. But I shall scarcely be sufficiently selfish to advise her remaining at West Hampton. It is greatly more likely that I shall coax my kind husband into passing a spring month or two in London, and in that case, Mr. Dorking, it is probable we may meet again. And now, as I have given you the advantage of all the information I possess, it only remains for you to tell me when your attack direct upon my little Judith is to come off. Even as Mrs. Chilbert uttered these light-sounding words, the color mounted to her delicate cheek, and a tear to her eye, and she added with a sort of abrupt earnestness that was very unlike her usual manner, Upon my word, Mr. Dorking, I shall be one of the most unhappy women living if I do not find, upon longer acquaintance, that you are everything I wish you to be. I tremble, very literally I tremble, Mr. Dorking, lest I should be acting rashly in this matter. She is such a sweet creature, and at this moment the happiness of her whole life is at stake, and that I, knowing you so little as I do, should dare to take so very decided a part actually terrifies me. And here the graceful self-possession, the habitual savoir-faire, the intense aversion to everything like sentimental display, which all and each made so essential a part of Mrs. Chilbert's character, gave way before natural feeling, and she wept as heartily as if she'd been a poor curate's wife who had never heard of such a thing as bien-séance in her life. Mr. Frederick Dorking, too, was one of those who, like herself, cling very tenaciously to the conventional graces and propriety of life, and who, even while thinking themselves authorized by their position to do what they like on many occasions, when it would be fitting for less favored individuals to be governed by a different law, rarely lose sight of the code which regulates all things relating to the usages of good society, and no one could ever have accused him of making a display of any sentiment too profound, either in quality or quantity, to justify his expecting sympathy from those by whom he was usually surrounded. But he, as well as his fair adviser, was too much in earnest at this moment to shape his words, or the manner of uttering them by any rule save that of genuine feeling. And so earnest and so solemn was the tone in which he besought her to believe that he felt the immense importance of the assistance she was giving him, and not that only, he added, but I feel the immense importance also of the deed you are doing, and all I can say, all I can do, rather, is to prove to you by my future conduct that I am not unworthy the confidence which you have so generously placed in me. There was so much real feeling in the manner with which these words were spoken that they could not fail in producing the effect which the speaker desired. Mrs. Chilbert wiped her tears away, and the remainder of the interview was passed in arranging the manner in which the young Judith should be made acquainted with the serious nature of the attachment she had inspired. Mrs. Chilbert felt that it spoke well for the delicacy of Judith's lover when he told her it was his wish that she should acquaint the orphan girl with his proposal before he was admitted to plead his own cause. I might judge differently on this point, he said, if her only ostensible protector for the present were a more efficient one than this detestable aunt, whose vulgar impertinence has placed herself absolutely beyond the reach of any farther civility or consideration of any kind. Nay, if the sweet girl herself were a few years older, I should not shrink, as I now do, from the idea of startling her by an abrupt proposal. You are right, most right, Mr. Dorking, replied Mrs. Chilbert with such eager cordiality of approval as settled the point at once, and he left her with the understanding that Judith should be invited to take a tete-a-tete -tete drive with her immediately, and that if he would repeat his visit at the deanery on the morrow, it was possible that he might find her passing a long, quiet day with her friend. "'God bless you, dearest Mrs. Chilbert!' exclaimed the agitated young man as he pressed her hand to his lips. Never, never can I hope to make you feel all the gratitude you've inspired. And then returning, after he'd left the room for a moment, he added, Do not let me come tomorrow if she receives what you will say to her today unkindly or coldly. If I hear nothing from you, I shall come. But if, 
If I receive a note from you either tonight or tomorrow morning early, I shall leave the hall directly, and you shall not see me again, dearest Mrs. Chilbert, till I have forgotten everything connected with West Hampton, except your kindness. This ends Chapter 11 of Petticoat Government, Volume 2, by Francis Milton Trollope.